Are the hallucinations irreversible? So we commonly would start, if somebody has Parkinson's and starts to get hallucinations, usually we start to lower their medicines. And a rule of thumb for me would be start with some of what are called the enzyme inhibitors. So that would be Intacapone or uh, Resagiline. Then eventually the dopamine agonist class, uh, so Pramipexol, uh, we would probably lower or, or take that away. And then we kind of leave carbidopa, levodopa, because that's the most effective medicine for movement, but we might lower the dose. So dose reduction would be the first step. Usually the hallucinations, it's not a rever usually they're reversible. So it's, it's adjustments can uh, more often than not substantially improve hallucinations. It's not a permanent uh, condition often. It usually first steps medication reduction. Dr. Bertoni, when do you test and how for LARC-2? Yes, and the ones that we don't get to, they again, they will be addressed in the Parkinson's post. We'll keep all of these cards and we'll do a few with each um, issue of the Parkinson's post. Dr. Sire, husband has bypass in 2006. How do you know when it's orthostatic blood pressure or heart issue? And then there, there's several of them related to hypertension versus blood pressure spiking versus orthostatic hypotension. So. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I didn't go into all the other things that, um, that can happen in dizziness. Dizziness is a very vague symptom. I focused on the orthostatic hypotension because that is a common thing in Parkinson's disease. So yes, it's very true that um, if there is dizziness that's happening in an episodic nature, we want to look at all things that are going on. So that's often why we'll get those orthostatic vitals to see that it, yes, it is the blood pressure that is um, the lower blood pressure that's causing this. But if there is history of cardiac or heart issues, that's one thing that we that we need to think about as well. So talking about your talking with your neurologist, um, cardiologist, your primary care doctor about monitoring the heart rate and the blood pressure to see exactly what the problem is. And then kind of the second part of that is, I think they were getting at if there's high blood pressure and low blood pressure. How do you manage that? And that is um, something I was alluding to a little bit when I was talking about how we would start um, Midadrin or Northera. Um, because what can happen is what we call supine hypertension. So when you lay flat, there can be really elevated blood pressures. And that puts you, um, having high blood pressures, as you know, puts you at higher risk for heart issues, heart attacks, um, and stroke. So we don't like people to have really high blood pressures for sustained periods of time. So sometimes there are some adjustments that need to be hap happening with medications um, and more complicated issues with um, uh, changing or adapting both the blood pressure medications that will boost up the blood pressure at certain times of the day and then lower it, especially when laying flat at night. I hope it's complicated, but I hope that um, at least partially answered the question. All right, we're gonna do two more. Um, Dr. Merman, if my family member is showing signs of worsening cognitive impairment, how do we make an appointment with Dr. Merman? <laughs> that is a magical good question. <laughs> First step, so talk to your movement disorder specialist and we all work together as a team and it's myself and Dr. Brizzo and then we, uh, so we'll be happy to see you. And uh, the movement disorder specialists are in tune with cognitive change too and they can screen you in, in clinic. I think if things are getting to be moderate to severe, I'm happy to be involved and, and try to help out. Cause 
as we've alluded to in a couple of questions, there's always a balancing act. We're going to try to boost the memory but not give you side effects in other areas. Great. And also, uh, one of the questions was neuropsych testing. How, do you, how does that get ordered? Also, any of your providers can order neuropsychological testing, so that also is, is appropriate. One more. Dr. Bertoni, there's lots on uh, vitamin questions. Do you recommend vitamin B and D supplements? Does levodopa affect vitamin B levels? And explain what's caused by low D and B, and what vitamins would be deficient. This is all yours. <laughs> First of all, you should probably be checked if you bleed with your simple blood test. The leading test in our conference is from vitamins B1, B6, B12, and vitamin D because it's very common in the B deficiency level. Vitamin D is in our head, helps with that strong bone. So if you have trouble walking, Okay, we have lots of questions that are um, according to our topics this afternoon, like on DBS and duopa therapy and stuff, so we'll have the providers later answer those questions. Since we do have so many uh, questions and extremely good questions, uh, over the lunch hour we'll have some of the providers that are still here and even the ones that are going to be presenting this afternoon come up and we'll take a few more questions and then we'll have another question and answer session uh, this afternoon. So go ahead and have a break, go to the bathroom, stand up and stretch, whatever you need to.
We're going to go ahead and get started with our next session. All right, we're going to have everybody take a seat at your leisure, of course. We have another amazing speaker, of course, Dr. Diego Torres. He is an associate professor in the Department of Neurological Science, and he truly has been my mentor. And many people ask me, why did you ever come to the university from Hastings, Nebraska? This is the guy right here is why I came. So I uh, introduce to you Dr. Diego Torres, and he is going to be speaking on advanced therapies. Thank you. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> don't, don't, don't move yet. Don't we have to give a immense uh, round of applause to Julie who has organized this amazing symposium. <laughs> We're gonna get a selfie, Julie. All right, turn around. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Julie's amazing. Well, uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a very uh, complicated uh, uh, topic, which is advanced Parkinson's disease and what we do when the disease starts advancing. Uh, there are many, many, many treatment options, and you actually need to do about a two-year uh, fellowship training to be able to handle all of these treatment options. So I'm going to simmer down two years into maybe uh, 20 minutes so that we can, we can get all of this done, all right? So lots of questions at the end, and I look forward to, uh, to, the, um, to the question panel. We're gonna be reviewing uh, generalities. We'll talk about dystonia and Parkinson's disease, motor fluctuations, uh, duopa therapy, deep brain stimulation surgery, and uh, how we go about the preoperative evaluation. Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, who has ever heard of Parkinsonism? Parkinsonism is just a collection of signs and symptoms. And Parkinsonism is diagnosed if you have at least two of the following features, resting tremor, stiffness, and slow movements. If you have two of those three, you have Parkinsonism. That doesn't mean that you have Parkinson's disease, because there are dozen causes of Parkinsonism. There are many types. One of the first things that we do at the uh, Parkinson Center when the patients come is to actually analyze what type of Parkinsonism the patient has and determine that over, uh, over time after multiple visits. The type of Parkinsonism that you, that you have determines treatment responsiveness, and determines prognosis. So it is key to understand what type of Parkinson's you have. And uh, the, uh, uh, our reliability of doing that grows with the, with the experience on seeing multiple patients or, or over many years uh, with Parkinson's disease. Um, so these are, you know, common symptoms uh, of patients with Parkinson's disease, but there are many conditions that can produce the same types of symptoms. At, as the disease advances, you start finding other problems that were not present at the beginning, like balance issues and gait disturbances and also motor fluctuations. But you are not alone. Your Parkinson's management team is huge. And as you can see here, I don't know, do we have a, let me see, oh, that's not it, okay. Um, so we start with the, with the neurologists uh, on top, and, uh, but we have nurses, nurse practitioners, phys physician assistants, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, your primary care physician, everybody has to work together and we do to uh, make sure that we improve the quality of life of the, of the Parkinson patient. Um, so what is this business of dystonia? Dystonia is characterized by excessive muscle contraction. It's like you have a muscle and you know that you can control your muscle, but now it's having contractions that you don't mean to have. 
So it's involuntary contractions of those muscles. And then that's making you produce excessive stiffness or jerking or abnormal movements or abnormal postures. Dystonia is definitely associated with disability and is highly under-recognized. Uh, there are patients that suffer from dystonia for 10 years before they get a diagnosis. And therefore, because it's under-recognized, it's terribly under-treated. What kinds of symptoms can be due to dystonia? Let's look at these pictures here on the very top uh, on the left, you have a, a young lady with a truncal dystonia. She has a, an abnormal posture of the trunk. Uh, next, you, have, you see a hand that looks, uh, it looks uh, totally deformed. That's a very famous patient because the patient was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, then years later was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and received levodopa, and what happened is that that dystonia, that arthritis completely went away. Because it wasn't arthritis, it was just the abnormal posture caused by the dystonia. Um, you see here uh, on the uh, bottom right, um, uh, two uh, pictures of two uh, patients on uh, one lady that is closing her eyes excessively and is unable to open her eyes. This is called blepharospasm, and it's actually common in Parkinson's disease. Some patients uh, look like they are asleep, but, but in fact, they are just having trouble keeping the eyes open. But it's not due to somnolence, it's due to the fact that they feel that it's hard to open their eyes. That is called blepharospasm, it's common in Parkinson's. The next picture is a lady that is having difficulty closing her jaw. And it's, it's not because you know, she's relaxing the jaw, it's all the way around. The muscles that pull the jaw open are excessive, uh, are working excessively and producing this abnormal posture. So dystonia can present in many ways. One foot dragging, tiptoe walking, foot turning, muscle spasms, severe stiffness, particularly of the neck. Many patients with Parkinson's disease have a stiff neck. Let's see, how many have a stiff neck? Yeah, and, and those that are female on top of a stiff neck have a pain in the neck if they happen to be married to a guy. <laughs> um, you can also have uncontrollable movements in the hand and in the face that